just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and will be broadcast on one of the RBG channels. Um, <clears throat> apologies for absence. I've received apologies from Councillor Asgard and Councillor Hartley. Any other apologies? No. Nope. Any declarations of interest? We have three sets of minutes um, to confirm as accurate. Anyone got any comments on the 21st of March? Yes. Um, I was in attendance, but I'm not listed as attending, so please can that be amended? That's fine. 27th of April? 11th of July? Nope. Then all of those are confirmed as accurate. Moving on to the first substantive item, that's the highways update. There are two parts to this update. Um, the first is on the highways audit, and the second is on the measures being taken to prepare for the opening of the Silvertown Tunnel. Um, are you running the update separately, or should we, how we have everyone up at the same time? Okay, great. Thanks. Would you like to introduce the report? Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, uh, the last um, meeting on this was uh, back in December 22, um, and uh, members will probably recall that the current maintenance strategy has been termed managed decline. Um, section 4 of the report has got a little summary to remind you what, what, how we defined that um, and uh, mentions that we're currently working on a highways asset management plan but if you'll remember that we wanted to develop a more comprehensive approach um, termed a highways infrastructure asset management plan so rather than just looking at highways and carriageways we'd um, look at structures as, and lighting and other aspects of the, of the highways as well in a more comprehensive way um, and and we'd, we'd look to be getting everything, everything up to an acceptable standard um, by reviewing all our, our data sources, including developing new data sources, um, looking at a costed 10-year plan and proposed treatments. Um, that, that was envisaged to be coming forward um, back in December 22, but there's been a bit delayed. Um, but we have um, undertaken um, some comprehensive surveys of carriageways and footways, which is reported on in, in section 4.4, and then the table that follows it over the page, um, which, which, is, which has been very useful. Um, we've been out, um, well, we commissioned actually um, surveys looking at the percentage of roads, sections of all the roads in the borough with defects, and then listing those in order with the highest percentage of defects to the lowest. Um, and uh, as a result of that, um, with our £1.2 million budget, we've done nine schemes which are, are listed there. Um, and um, there's actually uh, a bit of money left over, as I, as I report to you this evening. We've spent about a million pounds on those nine, as it turns out. And so there's a couple more schemes coming, probably during or just after the October half term. Um, I'm happy to go into a bit more detail about what we do around delivering that carriageway programme. Um, but, but but that's the, the borough roads. The, um, the, the principal road network, um, which is, is, is um, roads that TfL would usually fund, um, we unfortunately didn't get any money again this year. So we, we put a bid in of £200,000 for Greenwich South Street, but we were, we were unsuccessful. Um, we haven't received any funding on the TfL principal roads um, since 2020 stroke 21 which is a real shame because I think I'm told by colleagues that seven years ago we got one million, we had one million pounds. So, so that's obviously a concern. Um, at the moment, moving on to section 4.6, we haven't actually got an equivalent revenue budget for footwear, footwear renewal schemes, even though we've, we've got information about the condition of footways. So, so that's something to consider. Um, but what I have done is in section 4.7, it's not all doom and gloom. There's been quite a bit of progress. There's a dozen bullet points there where I've just set out some of the main things that, that um, the service has been delivering or is, is planning to deliver, um, the highlights of the year, I suppose. Um, I won't list them all out, um, but I will confess that the, um, the, the street lighting dimming, uh, which is the third bullet point, is probably going to be a little bit delayed. We're still working on that due to technical issues. Um, but, but there's been some good successes. Um, I, I'd mentioned the Creek Road lifting bridge. Um, the, the refurbishment of that, the deck of that, was a, was a real, really good project um, back in May. 
Uh, and the big thing that's coming up later in the year is the final bullet point with the um, major works of the Petman Crescent flyover, which is undoubtedly going to be quite disruptive, but there's a lot of preparation going on and a lot of um, close and collaborative um, liaison with key stakeholders on that. Um, and the final point is just to mention that the streetscape guidance is on, is on hold as well, which is mentioned in section 4.8. I think that concludes my summary of the, uh, the report, Chair. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hannan? Thank you for the report and for the readout. It's very helpful. Can I just ask a question about the TfL funding and why we haven't been getting it? Have you done kind of any analysis or understanding of why we may not be successful, why we haven't been successful since 2020, 2021? Um, I haven't got um, detailed feedback. It's probably something we should ask the TfL about. But what they do is each year they ask boroughs to put forward their worst condition roads that they feel are the worst condition on the principal road network in their in their area and then tfl fund a certain portion of those and we just haven't i guess the answer is that other boroughs have got roads in worse condition on their principal network than we have but what we can do is um go back to tfl and ask for some clarification around that and see what we need to do to tick the box next year um obviously there's a sort of two edges to this though um, you, you want to get some funding, but if you understand the reasoning why you don't get it, it's because your roads aren't as bad as other boroughs. There's some reassurance that they're not in that bad a condition, but still, we'd like the money, um, and we'd like to do some roads. As we said, we had a budget of, um, you know, a million pounds not, not so many years ago. So we do need to do something because it, it only adds to the managed decline scenario that we've been talking about, whereas actually we want to get onto the front foot um, in terms of what we're delivering and some in some areas we are in the scenario of having a, a sort of investment asset management plan in place for certain parts of our infrastructure but not all of them and the principal roads are going to end up lagging behind if we're not careful so I'm happy to go back and um, seek some more information and feedback from TfL on that and then we can modify our approach accordingly next year really helpful if we can go back to them um it may it may not be that our roads are not that bad because we get a lot of traffic through our roads so i would be surprised if there hadn't been decline over the years it may be that we're not presenting it in the right way so i think it'd be great to get that feedback formally from tfl would you like to make that as an official recommendation yes please thanks um councillor dows I just wanted to ask you a bit more about the managed decline. Obviously, it's not where I'm sure you'd want to be at, but um, do you see a situation in which we can come out of that? Obviously, I'm assuming it's funding related, um, but the worry clearly is for future councillors and what they're gonna have to then um, live with so I just wondered if you could see a situation in which we'll ever come out of that situation yes thank you councillor Th through, through you chair um, it, it really is about um, money to be honest um, and um, it, it's really about making sure that you've got the right investment at the right time um, and, and, and it might it may well vary I mean, it will vary across years some years you'll need to do major maintenance on bridges and so on which are very expensive compared to just relaying some footway if you do a proper investment management plan, you can predict when's the optimum time to treat the relevant roads, the relevant carriageways, when's the best time to do the street lighting, etc. And then you can start to forward plan your budget so that, that um, the council has advance notice of when you're going to need the uh, extra funding, when some years you might not need so much. So I, I, I can see it, it, it um, in the next 12 to 18 months, I can see us developing a plan um, but then it will be subject to funding. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Um, hi, and thank you. Thank you for your report. It was just a, a question really at 4.6 about uh, footways. Um, and I wondered, you mentioned a sort of footway renewal scheme. What money do we have for footway maintenance? Um, so sort of patching instead of renewing. And... Are there any bits of the borough where footways are particularly bad? 
Um, I'm sort of thinking in the context of people that use wheelchairs, footways that are regularly travelled and that are sort of more, I was going to say sort of commuter routes, routes to sort of bus stations, our high streets, that sort of thing. Um, because clearly if, if footways become so bad, they also then offer up the opportunity to become trip hazards and just have a huge knock-on effect to people's confidence in going to places um, and which then has a knock-on effect onto our, our high streets and things like that. So I just wondered uh, just how bad our footways are. Thank you, Councillor. Um, th th through you, Chair, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what our budget is. I probably should, should know that figure. Um, but we do spend it fully on, on reactive r repairs. Um, um, the bad locations, again, um, some, some areas of the borough, I know like the town centres, have got quite good treatment of footways um, through various improvements. Um, and I know um, in Woolwich Town Centre, for example, they're working on um, refurbishing Beresford Square and Power Street, which we've got future high streets funding for. So that, that, that's, a, that's a tick in the box. Um, um, what, what we have also got some um, TFL um, local implementation plan funding for things like dropped curbs. So we, we have got a program where we're delivering those in various locations. I haven't got the details with me. What we do is we um, undertake our inspections um, in, more frequently in locations where there's higher footfall. So those are the locations where we look to make sure that, the, um, that if there are loose paving slabs, we get our contractor out to fix those, and therefore people don't trip up. But it's very much that's a risk-based approach that um, is, is sort of driven by insurance claims, because obviously if, if the footways aren't in good condition, there's trips and falls and slips, then people will put insurance claims in, which puts even more pressure on the council budgets. So that's all the more reason for making sure that we're proactive and doing relay schemes um, at, at the right time. Um, footways are subject to less wear and tear than carriageways. Um, the main issue is vehicle overruns, heavy vehicles, which will just crack paving slabs when they go straight o right over them. Um, but, but generally, footway relay schemes don't need to take place so often as, as carriageways. Um, and, and another f key factor to think about going forward is what material we use. So um, I think you find locations where, um, where um, the highway infrastructure is maintained in the most efficient manner, uh, it's all pretty black and white. And what I mean by that is that it's, it's black tarmac and, and artificial stone paving ASP for the footways and, and bitumous material in, in, in between for, for um, you know, drop curbs and so on. Um, and any other materials that you choose to put in that are, depart from that increase maintenance costs over the life because you've got to maintain supplies of specialist materials that you might have to get from a particular quarry somewhere, for example. So that's the disadvantage of the sort of materials that you see in locations like Beresford Square in, 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 in Woolwich, where I believe we're short of the materials for spares at the moment, but we're going to recover some as part of the current project. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of issues to consider, um, but we haven't got a budget for, for footway relay schemes at the moment, but I think we'll, as a service and as something that's coming out of this highway infrastructure asset management plan, we'd be looking to put a growth bid in to set up a budget. But I, I do think Greenwich has been quite lucky in uh, recent years with all the developments going on. Um, we've been able to get um, good quality footways in the vicinity of those developments and there's quite a lot throughout the borough so that's helped to improve the position but it's it's not really the way forward in the in the longer term we need to be looking at footways um, carefully and making sure we target the program at locations where um where there's a lot of damage and, and we've got a lot of claims and a lot of uneven footways councillor salden Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mervyn, for the report. Uh, just a quick question. Recognising that it is managed decline uh, that we're talking about in this report, uh, has work been done to work out what essentially maintaining in a static condition, i.e. not getting any worse or any better, would be, and also what it would be, uh, what it would take to actually return it to a, uh, what you would consider to be an acceptable condition? And I know acceptable is a highly subjective term, but something that we could essentially make sure that we weren't storing up problems for the future. Thank you, um, Councillor. Yeah, I mean, 
the, the answer to that is really we haven't done that work as of yet. That, that's something that would have to come out, that will come out of the highways infrastructure work, look, looking, as I said a bit earlier in the introduction, looking more holistically across um, street lighting, footways, carriageways, structures, um, sorry, bridges, other structures, all highway signage and so on, identifying the optimum time to intervene and either um, put in repairs or, or undertake works that will extend whole whole life of those um, various elements of the infrastructure. So we haven't we haven't done that yet, but we've made a start in terms of, of, of working on the carriageways and the um, the report explains what we've done on, on, on those. But there's more to do. Um, and and yeah, looking at whole life costing and um, the the possibly the sort of software we need to support that that work that, that can look automatically at, at data that we get from from surveys and, and and then you can program in the amount of funding you've got and come up with an optimal strategy for how best to spend the money. Thank you. So if I could just ask a follow-up, I may have missed this in your presentation that you made, so apologies, Chair, and uh, other members of the panel for being late, and to yourself as well. Um, do we have a time scale on when we're likely to be able to do that? Because I'm just aware that with maintenance, the longer you leave it in a state of managed decline, the worse it's going to be when you eventually have to do it. Yeah, I, I can't be too definitive on the time scale because at the last meeting we said we were going to work on the um, Highways Investment Asset Management Plan um, earlier this year and we haven't started it yet. So, um, but having said that, we've almost adopted part of that approach in some of the things we've been doing individually, but not holistically. So the, there's a dozen schemes, that uh, elements that are talked about in the report um, that, that would incorporate this sort of highways investment approach. Um, but at the moment, we've really had to target things that really need doing, um, like the Creek Road lifting bridge, for example, the scheme that's coming up at Petman Crescent um, later, later in the year at Christmas. Um, but, but some of our, our work has um, been very comprehensive. So the LED lighting, which is virtually complete, I think we've done, I think it was wrong, 19,000 out of the 20,000 lights. Um, that's been very successful. So that's, that's, a, that's a good example, but we're a little bit patchy so we've done some work on carriageways, we've done good work on street lighting, some structures. We haven't surveyed the condition of our structures for several years, which is something we should be doing on an annual basis. Um, so we've just we've got that work in going on at the moment, so we're bringing that up to standard. But obviously footways, as we've mentioned, are lagging behind. So it, it, we're, we're, we're doing a sort of incremental approach at the moment, but we hope to bring it together um, when we've got resources to look at and develop this infrastructure plan more comprehensively. Yes, yeah, so my actual question was, uh, do you have a timeline on, no. in terms of, uh, it, I'm not asking for a specific date, but are we talking about, you know, the next time you see us or the time after that or within the life of this council or uh, within a year? That sort of thing is what I'm after. So just trying to prepare ourselves for when we might be looking to, look at this big comprehensive piece of work that you're doing. Thank you, um, through you, Chair. Uh, I think it's, in all, realist, in all realism, it's probably a task that we'd be looking to get stuck into more comprehensively next financial year. Thank you. Um, just a question on 4.4. Um, you mentioned that the, the, the sections of carriageway resurfacing are due to the sort of high defective percentage. What was the percentage threshold for being included in that list, please? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, I, I don't know the, uh, the, the, the details, but I can certainly find out for you. Um, I, I, it's basically a very long spreadsheet with every road in the borough in it and um, various percentages, but I can't remember now what the, the percentage statistics were range from sorry that's I fine um, out, Raymond can we take an action just to find that out if that's okay um, because I think it'd be, it would be interesting to know because obviously as with everything we're limited on budgets when we had this report last time it talked a sort of bigger picture of what we would need to sort of get to more of that static state and I, I think the thing that's missing for me from this report is seeing I can see what we've managed to do within the £1.3 million budget, I think, off the top of my head, £1.2 million budget, but what ideally would we have done? 
um, it, it, would, it would be nice to sort of see where that percentage lies to get, to get a sense of the scale of the issue that we're facing here. I think that'd be really helpful if you could share that spreadsheet. Yeah, I'm ha happy, happy to share that. J just, I suppose, to give you a little bit of perspective. So um, I previously worked for London Borough Barnet. Uh, um, obviously, it's quite a big borough. Um, but in order to get their carriageways up to standard, they agreed um, to spend £50 million. So if that puts it into a little bit of perspective for you. And do you have any idea in terms of this year's budget process what you would be sort of bidding for within part of that budget process? No, not, I, I think that's something to, for the assistant director and director to consider, um, to, to, to be honest. I'm, I'm sure we'll put a growth bid in for a footway relay um, budget. Um, and, and obviously we'll put a bid in for more money for carriageways, but we have to compete against all the other demands the council's got for all the other things they deliver, obviously adult social care, etc. Are there any other questions from the panel? No. Thank you so much for the report and for your time, Mervyn. Really appreciate it. Um, we move now on to the second part of, um, of this item, and we welcome TFL, who are here um, to speak to us about planning for the Silver Town Tunnel and the effect that will have on the local highways network. Um, I believe we have Chris Lynch, Andrew Lunt, and Marissa Donner. Okay. And Ryan. Thank you very much for joining us. Ryan, if you'd like to introduce the item. Yeah. Um, so I'm Ryan Bunce, the Transport Strategy Manager here at the Royal Borough of Greenwich. Um, and we lead our transport work on Silvertown in my group. Um, don't want to go into too much detail. There's some background on Silvertown in there, but I'm sure you'll all be aware that it's, it's a new tunnel and where it is and the process it's been through. Um, the borough has a role as local planning authority and highway authority in um, consenting or agreeing to certain detail matters from the project and in a consultative group called the Silvertown Tunnel Implementation Group, looking at technical matters related to monitoring and mitigation. So some of the things TFL will be telling us about shortly. But broadly, you know, it's a TFL scheme. Um, and in particular, the monitoring and mitigation strategy is a responsibility they've retrained, retrained, retained. Um, so we've invited them here to talk about that. Um, we're obviously engaging very closely with them as they develop that and we'll be kind of raising issues and I'm also here to answer any questions the panel have about our engagement and response to the work they're describing. Yeah, so we'll get straight into it. We'll, we'll fly relatively quickly through some slides we've prepared to give a bit of background about what we're doing uh, and then give you some time for questions. Uh, yeah, so to properly introduce myself, Andrew Lunt, I'm a uh, lead sponsor in a bit of TFL, it's called Investment Delivery Planning, uh, so we sponsor our capital investment program, my team leads on some of the sort of what we call major projects, so the bigger projects, including things like Silvertown Tunnel. Uh, Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello, um, I'm Chris Lynch, I'm a transport planning manager at TFL, um, and I work in the same area as Andrew, uh, but on the planning side, uh, looking, working on major projects. So I'll, I'll give a bit of background uh, if we flick up an agenda. Background, uh, bring you up to speed on where we are on, on the Silvertown Tunnel project, introduce you to the commitments we made, as Ryan referred to, uh, in our monitoring and mitigation strategy, but much more broadly under the terms of the development consent order, how the scheme's been developed. And then I'll let Chris come in on the sort of technical detail of how that process is going, because Chris is sort of in that technical detail. His team are leading on all the modeling work, all the assessment work in detail that's going on now. Uh, so, a reminder of why we're doing uh, Silvertown Tunnel. Um, it's because the existing situation at the Blackwall Tunnel uh, has real significant negative impacts on travel, the economy, the environment across not just Greenwich but the wider areas of South East and East London. This is the problem we're trying to address, that Blackwall uh, is one of the most important river crossings, road crossings of the Thames in London, uh, one of the only strategic road crossings in East London. It's one of the busiest certainly very unreliable with daily congestion that you uh, obviously see um, heavily in Greenwich. And that congestion is a regular occurrence because of poor reliability and it impacts on the wider road network in Greenwich. 
uh, impacts on the bus service that operates through the Blackwall Tunnel and in the wider area when that congestion, that traffic spills out onto the road network. So we're delivering the Silvertown Tunnel Scheme to address those issues. Um, we believe and our work shows it will transform transport in the area through a combination of measures. Yes, the new road capacity enabled by the new tunnels that we're constructing, but also the control of travel demand through road user charging to ensure we can intelligently and effectively manage traffic levels, encourage journey types, and further supporting that, the provision of a comprehensive new network of cross-river bus services um, to encourage people to take up public transport for their cross-river journeys and to support the growth in cross-river journeys and the growing areas either side of the river with more and better public transport opportunities. And, and really critically, the new infrastructure provides better resilience to the regular instance you see at the Blackwall Tunnel. So these are the objectives. These are, this is what we expect the Silvertown Tunnel to do. Um, and it's obviously been in discussion for a long time, but to bring you to where we are now before we start to reflect on the commitments we've made and what we're doing ahead of opening, we're in kind of big, heavy construction stage. As Ryan referred to, we've got a main contractor it's actually largely privately funded, the Silvertown Tunnel, uh, through a consortium called Riverlinks, who are on site constructing the tunnel uh, and some exciting photos of what's going on in Greenwich with the TBM tunnel boring machine having completed tunneling. Major excavations now largely complete, finishing off cross passages and the big tie-in connections to the highway. So we're right there at the crux of big construction and we're about uh, what we expect to open the scheme in, in 2025. So we're sort of 18 months from opening. Um, obviously, with lots to go in construction. And so what are we doing to prepare for that, as Ryan's referred to? So while Riverlinks are constructing the tunnel, um, the retained obligation, as Ryan refers to, is where, where TfL comes in. We've got a contract of building a new asset. But in terms of how the network runs, the impacts of this scheme in operation, we very much retain that function, uh, setting the user charge, planning the bus network, managing the road network. And this reflects on sort of a comprehensive body of work we've undertaken since this scheme was talked about probably over 10 years ago now, uh, which originally culminated in the development consent order, which was granted in 2018 by the Secretary of State for Transport, and that we've built on since then. So at that time, we had a comprehensive transport assessment that demonstrated, I realize this has come up a bit messy, this slide, but I'll talk to it. Uh, we had a comprehensive transport assessment uh, which, which set out the significant positive benefits this scheme would have on transport in the area in terms of unlocking the queues at the Blackwall Tunnel and improving the road network performance across the river and in the wider areas either side of the river, the new opportunity for new bus services. So that was set out and it was quite clear the positive impacts the scheme would have and that any potential adverse impacts would be appropriately managed. But we went further and probably further than many promoters would go. You certainly wouldn't see this on some bigger national highway schemes in other parts of the country where we've committed to essentially proving that, to following that through, to making sure we do actually deliver on those commitments and those expectations and those forecasts that we've modelled because we know models are only as good as what you put in. We've, Chris and the team, many people at TfL, we've got absolute world-class experts in modelling and appraisal of traffic and transport, but it's a model. And so we've committed to updating that, and we're doing that in the run-up to scheme opening now to inform what we're going to do. And we're going to continue that after the scheme opens through monitoring traffic, air quality, other things, to make sure this scheme really delivers what we have promised, what we expect, which is that significant positive impact on the road network and on travel in this part of London. And to be crystal clear, we've made legally binding commitments to that under the development consent order. And we want to do that in line with our broader uh, policy objectives at TfL. Uh, so just to finish off my bit, um, to get into the detail of what that means pre-opening, so the item we requested to come here to talk about, sort of plans to prepare for pre-opening. So all of our previous work's being built on, we're doing lots of more updated modeling assessment, we've got monitoring data that we're, we're plugging in, we're talking regularly with not just Greenwich but all the boroughs through this group Ryan referenced, and that's got three primary purposes uh, and we're half, sort of kind of halfway through that process now where we're trying to specify the opening year bus network uh, and you'll have seen we recently announced uh, contracts to operate two of those routes with new zero emission buses including one of the uh, what will be the Superloop 4 routes through the tunnel uh, and then 
define any requirements for extra localized mitigation and say our, our work showed how the scheme would function really effectively, but a sense check on is there any little adjustments we need to make to make sure of that. And then looking to the future, we'll be setting the opening year user charges. So uh, what we're focused on right now is that bit in the middle, and that's probably where I'll bring Chris in to talk through that detailed process we're going through to do that. Cheers. Thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> um, so Andrew mentioned that we have a monitoring and mitigation strategy, um, which is a certified document under the DCO. Um, it's sort of split into two sides. There is a refreshed assessment of impacts of the scheme, um, which, as Andrew was saying, is to determine the bus net opening bus network, um, any, any residual um, local mitigation measures we need to do on the highway, and also um, setting the user charge. Um, but the other side of that is quite a comprehensive monitoring program. So this is not only sort of a forecast before and then drop everything and forget when the tunnel opens. We're committed to doing at least three years of quite comprehensive monitoring of um, traffic and um, air quality and socioeconomic impacts that the scheme's having. So um, <laughs> we'll be following that through and, and seeing if our forecasts that we are, our models are showing us are, are right when, when it opens. But just to go through this slide, so this is a, um, uh, a, a process um, chart that was in the monitoring and mitigation strategy that sets out with regards to the local highway mitigation, how do we establish any locations on the network where we think we need to look at in, in a bit more detail um, any, any mitigation measures that are needed. Um, and it's a two-part process where we used our um, traffic, uh, strategic traffic modeling that TfL uses, that the boroughs use um, um, across London to establish a long list of locations based on a series of different sort of thresholds and flags. So looking at delay, looking at increases in flows, looking at where junctions perhaps go over capacity, uh, looking at journey times, uh, looking at bus journey times, so not just focusing on, on car trips. Um, and we put all that into the model, and then that sort of spits out what the, uh, the long list is. And then through the, the, uh, the implementation group um, that we have, which is another requirement of the, uh, of, of the DCO, um, on which we have um, uh, Greenwich officers, so through Ryan um, and, and others, um, we, we, consult, we consulted with Stig back on, about a year ago um, on, on that long list um, uh, to then establish a sort of short list of locations where we actually need to sort of focus on what, what we need to do. Um, so if I just move on to the next slide, um, any locations on the long list that didn't make a, sh a short list um, are um, put onto our monitoring program. And I mentioned about the monitoring program being comprehensive. Um, it's probably hard to see the detail of this because there's lots of little dots, um, but that effectively that is showing the uh, extent of the monitoring that we will do, we are doing at the moment and we will do post opening. Um, and any, and the, the, the list on the right hand side other locations that flag within the modeling that indicated that we need to look at some further, do some further monitoring just to check that any of the impacts that the, uh, the scheme has when it opens are, are managed. Um, but some of those locations you'll see, like Shooter's Hill, um, you've, we already have a lot of monitoring happening there anyway as a result of it being on the TLRN. Okay, so in, in terms of the short list, um, there aren't many locations on the shortlist. Let me just quickly show you the, the following um, slide. Um, this is a slide showing where we are proposing um, to undertake um, mitigation. There are three locations where some uh, minor changes to the highway network are, are, are proposed north of the river. Um, the re remaining locations are where we're just promos proposing signal timing optimization. Um, and that's where we um, uh, reviewed the signal timings at key locations, key junctions um, that, have, uh, that are flagged on, on the shortlist. Um, but the modeling has shown that if you uh, optimize the signal timings, taking balancing all the different modes that use that, that part of the, the street network, um, that, that we can actually solve the, the issues, the forecast to be solved. Um, just going back one slide, um, this just explains how our approach to that mitigation. Um, the idea is that, uh, that when Silvertown Tunnel opens, um, the target is for nil detriment to all modes, which is effectively means um, when Silvertown Tunnel opens, we are trying to get the network back to what it was before it opened by ironing out some of the issues that are flagged in the modeling. Um, so the, where we've got um, signal timing optimization proposed, um, they are 
minor changes on the network or minor changes in flow where there's different routing through the network. Um, but, we, but, but the modeling has indicated that we're able to, to manage that effectively. Uh, just a little bit about what signal timing optimization actually is. Um, it's something that TFL um, does frequently, um, not just in response to uh, projects that open, but also other changes on the network. So the Network Performance uh, Directorate um, undertakes 1,200 signal timing reviews every year. Um, so this is sort of business as usual for them. Um, however, the, the difference with this is that we are going to be um, comprehensively monitoring these locations afterwards and for at least three years. So there's quite a lot of scrutiny that's going to be placed on the, the, the pre-planning work that's done that, that makes sure that, we, that w when we go live, um, the, uh, we can actually manage the issues. Um, and finally, uh, other residual issues in Greenwich. So um, there were three locations where we've got signal timing optimization um, as a, um, a solution. Um, there's a known um, issue along the 806 corridor between Greenwich and Woolwich. It's very congested. Um, it's a constrained network. You've got the new um, cycleway four there. Um, and uh, there are existing problems today that are, that are known for about for in, in, in TFL. Um, and what happens when you then put a sort of a, a new change to the network, like Silvertown Tunnel, you get any small changes in flow um, trigger flags on, on, a, on a congested corridor like that. And that's not a unique situation to Greenwich. It happens across other parts of the network in London. Um, so the, the, what we've identified here is, um, if you look at the, the sort of fifth bullet point there, um, we've done some sensitivity testing with the modeling that indicates if we um, adopt active travel management, traffic management um, along this corridor, um, we can manage any issues that, that arise. Uh, but what that requires is um, uh, looking at sort of different traffic signal strategies, uh, but also monitoring the network real time. And we've got a series of uh, cam camera, ne um, uh, camera network, which feeds into our control center at TFL. Um, we've got bus routes where the drivers actually have direct connectivity to the, to the network operators and can, um, and can uh, let, let them know if there's any issues on the network. Um, and also members of the public often, often contact us. So, and, and it's a tried and tested um, approach um, that was actually uh, adopted on when London had the Olympics on the Olympic route network and the Paralympic road network, where it took a corridor approach just to, under, just to make sure that there were plans in place for when something like um, you know, the Olympics comes along, a tunnel opens, you know, you're going you're gonna to get potentially some unexpected changes. But we, we, this is just a case of being super prepared. Um, and I think that's... That's where we're at with this. So in terms of any next steps on this, we're just going to continue to engage with, with STIG, uh, with, uh, with borough officers on, on how these plans develop going forward, as we're required to do. Um, and uh, hopefully we've got a, a plan in place and we're going to monitor extensively once the tunnel's open. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation. <clears throat> um, it would have been quite helpful, I think, to have that presentation in advance, because obviously it's quite technical, and it was, a, I can see from the faces of people on the panel, it was a lot to sort of take in with questions. Um, is it possible to have an electronic copy of the, the presentation, yeah, of so course. that if any questions come to us after this, we'd be able to? Yeah, I, I know there was some sort of debate about uh, which, which panel we're coming to, so apologies for not getting it in advance. Uh, we're absolutely happy to share that, and happy to keep talking councillors, you're obviously entitled to scrutinise a big thing going on in the borough. Thank you. Um, one of the things that struck me that I didn't feel that you touched on was impact it might actually have on the quality of the roads. So if um, there's an increase in HGVs, for example, because they decide to use Silvertown rather than going the Dartford Crossing, and so we have more HGVs in the borough, that obviously puts pressure on our road services. Uh, the quality of road surfaces on those main routes being monitored and what happens if we do see them degrade as a result of that? Um, so I'll answer that in two parts. Firstly, we do not expect additional HDV traffic to be attracted to the Silvertown Tunnel. I know that's a, a fear and a risk um, that's recognised locally and we recognise that and that's why we're going to be carefully monitoring it. But our modelling shows and our objectives to this scheme are about managing traffic and actually we expect to see a slight diversion of heavy goods vehicles to the Dartford Crossing outside of London because we remove the current sort of free incentive that the Blackpool Tunnel offers 
So a uh, heavy goods vehicle journey doesn't want to pay the charge at Dartford can divert through London and go through Blackwell Tunnel for free today. That will not be the case once our scheme opens and we'll be able to manage that effectively. I know there's been lots of suggestions about the height of the tunnel being sort of supposedly larger for heavy goods vehicles. It is absolutely designed to modern standards, whereas the uh, sort of over 100-year-old northbound Blackwell Tunnel has a height restriction, but that height restriction blocks a relatively limited number of heavy goods vehicles. So point being, we don't expect that to happen. But if it does happen, we absolutely will pick it up through this monitoring program. We'll understand the makeup of traffic through that. Uh, and uh, then specifically on condition monitoring of roads, obviously TfL does that for its roads, the Transport for London Road Network. But through working with your officers, our asset management team does have a view of uh, the condition of the strategic road network. Our, my team aren't personally involved in that, so I'm not sure what level of detail that goes down in terms of local roads, but it certainly will be picking up the principal borough road network. And that's where we can understand condition, we can understand change in traffic flow through our monitoring, and absolutely a conversation about what that means in terms of maintenance. I know you, you obviously had a conversation earlier about lack of TfL maintenance funding, uh, which, which, which possibly reflects the sort of broader TfL financial position at the moment. But obviously all of that data can and should be fed into uh, the conversation about, about funding of borough roads, and we'd have the data to do that, absolutely. Thanks. And then if you are, if the modelling is wrong on HGVs, because as you say, it is, it is a concern, particularly as HGVs don't tend to be paying the tolls themselves, whereas people do, um, so they might not be deterred by that. What is the strategy for making sure that Greenwich is, isn't, um, suffering as a result of more HGVs in terms of in terms of traffic, in terms of noise, in terms of pollution, and in terms of damage to our roads. Uh, so it, it depends on what the specific impact is, but we'll have the data to understand if that does happen. So we'll understand if there is more heavy goods vehicle traffic and on what specific roads that's happening as a result of all this work we've just explained. The response to that would then depend on the specific road. If it's something. Uh, but to sort of speculate what it might be looking at, the kind of tools we might implement. Uh, if it's a sort of general increase in traffic levels across the area, we can obviously look at the user charge and whether the levels are right, whether they need to be optimised, increase for certain types of vehicles. We're quite clear that it will be different for certain types of vehicles, uh, and that's something we need to consider. We obviously need to consider its relevance to Dartford. Is it more than Dartford? Does it need to be higher? So that's the big tool in terms of general traffic. And then obviously on specific roads, we would work with borough officers and with our colleagues to look at a targeted approach for a specific road, whether that is banning heavy goods vehicle traffic in extreme, looking at gating strategies, traffic management solutions to, to make that route less attractive for the kind of journeys that heavy goods vehicles are making. And obviously this is all uh, sort of dependent on, on broader context of how London grows and develops as well. This is the kind of, and back to the slide Chris brought up about sort of what we do a lot of this is stuff we do day to day throughout London and our teams, our operational teams are always reviewing and looking at this and what this sort of scope of work is going to make sure is we're really focused on Greenwich and Newham and Town Hamlets and, 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 and the wider area but, but in Greenwich focused and ready to react to that with really up to date live data and, and just a final point, through that process we're absolutely committed to a transparency in that data through publishing all of these reports and keeping the council consulted uh, including through this Silvertown Tunnel Implementation Group that we've committed to. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, worth, it's worth just saying with regards to that monitoring programme, in the first year we are required to do quarterly reports and report back to the, um, the STIG group. Um, but also prior to opening, we, um, are, um, we will take a sort of comprehensive monitoring plan to that group within which we have sort of set thresholds and triggers and things which prompt us to look at something more carefully so you know we will know what's happening on the network through the monitoring and we'll know that through a plan that's determined by both by TfL but also through the STIG process prior to opening. And those thresholds they're agreed by the members of the STIG group? Yes. Thank you. Um, Councillor Selden? Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very comprehensive. You actually answered pretty much all the questions I had, plus the chair asked the rest of them. I had one question. Uh, you mentioned that the tunnel is being built to modern standards, so you can drive an HGV through it if you could. I've definitely been of the view that just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean that you should do. 
So has any been th ought been given to restricting it to non-articulated lorries or maybe the 32 tonne limits uh, going through it? Uh, and this is up front rather than say something we're going to do later on or the other way around. Um, so at the development stage of the scheme, we, we did think about what kind of traffic would be allowed through the tunnel. I'll, I'll come back to the point that most of the vehicles you're referring to are already traveling through the northbound Blackwall Tunnel and certainly through the southbound Blackwall Tunnel where there is, is very little constraint. The northbound does have a height constraint, um, but it, that's sort of blocking a relatively limited number of the, the heavy goods vehicle fleet in London. Um, so we could consider that, uh, but it's really going to be quite a constraint on what is the only strategic road crossing in London. Now, I've referred to how we would like, and our strategy is to encourage heavy goods vehicle movements to move outside of London to the Dartford Crossing if they can. But you've got to recognise that lots of these journeys are coming into Greenwich, Newham, Tower Hamlets, the wider boroughs of East London and beyond, because this is the only strategic river crossing, road crossing of the Thames in East London. So to service the developments happening in this area and East London uh, will be very difficult if we're constraining the, the scope of heavy goods vehicles that are allowed to use the Blackwall tunnels. Um, better to manage it, and our modelling shows that actually we probably will see slightly less heavy goods vehicles than today because we will encourage some of them to go back out to Dartford because they're not making journeys into London. Uh, so given that you're not putting a constraint on the vehicles can travel through the tunnel, have you given any thoughts to the times when they can do? Um, so at the moment, we don't plan to ban specific vehicles at a certain time. I should, I should note one exemption will be around specific dangerous goods vehicles, but that's a really very minor class of, of, of sort of carrying dangerous substances in a, in a lorry. Um, time of day, not currently in our plan to plan, ban specific vehicles at specific times of day, but I come back to the charging proposals where we will, while we haven't made final decisions about this, likely look to have a, a dynamic charging mechanism where different times of day vehicles are charged different amounts to uh, uh, to encourage the right travel patterns that we want to see in line with our objectives to manage traffic impacts air quality whatever that might be uh, so it might be for example that northbound in the morning peak time you have a higher charge to discourage those kind of journeys being made It's uh, still the same sort of thing. And have you given thoughts within your constraints, I'm sure you may have done this already, to any sort of season ticket pricing or local uh, discounts for local people? Uh, we're still thinking about it is the, uh, the, the short answer. And uh, the sort of earlier slide, I flipped back to it, we've sort of come here to bring you an update on the middle bit. We've kind of done the buses bit, although still work today. The user charging conversations, I think, are going to be much more active next year. And we will obviously be talking to the council about the details of what those proposals are. Um, but at the moment, our, our sort of intention and reflecting on what we, we, we envisaged at the time of the DCO, um, we'd, we'd certainly look to encourage people to register and become regular registered payers of the charge like we have on some of our other charging schemes in London. And we are looking to offer a, uh, a discount or potential exemption for certain local residents, but that's likely to... Uh, be targeted at, at local residents in Greenwich, Newham and Tower Hamlets only and likely to be targeted at those on low incomes rather than a broad brush residence discount um, for the purpose of managing traffic. And a, a point I would like to make about that is that we will also be really encouraging people to take up the new bus services that we're offering to switch to public transport and we are committed to offering concessionary travel on that, those bus services to local residents for uh, an opening period, exact details and, uh, and timescales of that to be defined, but we want to give local residents concessionary travel on the new bus services to encourage them to take that up and reflect on the sort of equity point. Actually, the lowest income people are, are not likely to drive, are likely to take that bus and really benefit from those new opportunities. So, so that's our commitment to local people, but more details to come next year. Thank you. Um, Ryan, would you like to say something? Just to add in, I suppose, on the, to add some comfort for the panel that uh, through the STIG and the other work, HUVs is something we're aware of as a concern, particularly for the borough. Um, through the DCO process, my predecessors, I think, led into a lot of the requirements that have given us this monitoring information. And through it, 
being produced, we've been scrutinizing the HGV bit, kind of asking similar questions and kind of exploring the, how realistic those assumptions seem, because I can see instinctively, it seems like it's gonna generate a lot more HGV traffic. HGVs are actually very sensitive to additional, they call them out of pocket costs, so parking, extra tolls. Um, if you look at the super big logistics organizations that we all probably think about, so Sainsbury's will have this worked out to the 10th of a penny and they would do exactly what's sufficient, but quite a lot of the fleet are smaller and contract operators and they are very sensitive to those additional costs, which is why you see loads of them through Blackpool despite it being unreliable and you know, you think you'd want to avoid it, but they actually avoid the Dartford toll. And the modeling seems to reflect that, which is quite an established trend, and it does seem to fit with that, but we're aware that it's a real concern and something that we're certainly making sure we check carefully. Thank you. Um, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got another question on top of the question I was going to ask now. Um, in terms of charging, Chair, if I can put forward this as a request, I guess, for a future panel, I think um, it would be quite helpful for us to see the proposed charging scheme before it's agreed. Um, I have various uh, concerns about what you've said, but I'm happy to wait until we actually have a, have a, a charging plan. Um, I think that would be helpful. And in your presentation, you said that you expect the tunnel to open in 2025. The paper says it's planned to open. You also mentioned 18 months, which takes us to March 2025. How confident are you this is going to be delivered on time? Uh, so taking your question in order, absolutely on the charging plans, as, as I've referred to on that slide, we're, we're still developing that. And of course, happy to come back and talk to the council when we've got more details. And, and we've already committed to consulting the council through this group on, on those proposals. Uh, and, and I would refer you back to some of the body evidence we had at the time of the DCO if you do want to sort of see the, the groundwork of it. Um, opening date, uh, we have confidence that we'll open in 2025. I refer to uh, 18 months, which takes a year to sort of spring 2025. Um, it's a big construction project. There's lots that can go wrong, does go wrong. Um, it's complicated, we're moving from that difficult place now of big digging holes to installing complicated systems and creating an operational asset, which is a real challenge. Um, we've, we've, we've had issues in the past, um, but we've got confidence. Uh, the contractors are forming well incentivized to have this open on time. Um, so without giving a definitive answer, a, a, a level of confidence, but yeah, like any big construction project, lots that can go well, lots can still go wrong, um, uh, and we'll have to keep keep it under review. Oh, sorry, you looked like you had another question. Uh, Councillor Dowse. I wanted to ask you about the bus routes through the tunnel. Um, I'm assuming these are going to be new routes. Has a decision been made about what routes are going to be run? And if not, will you be consulting on that? Um, we did consult on the routes. I uh, believe, to my head, we launched consultation around December last year and closed it sometime early this year. Uh, off the back of that, we, we, we considered the feedback and announced that we intended to go ahead with three well, what, what, what's described as three initial routes through the tunnel. One of those is the existing 108, which will have some minor changes to it. Um, the 129, which will be extended uh, across the river to Beckton, um, so to go via City Airport, and the Superloop 4, as it's now known, um, which will be an extra express service, which runs from Grove Park to Canary Wharf. It will run express from Sun and the Sands roundabout through the tunnel uh, to the north side of the river and into Canary Wharf. Um, we've now awarded contracts. We've obviously got the 108 operating today. We've got to make some minor changes to it uh, and some discussions with that operator for the 129 extension, extended route and the Superloop for uh, last week, I believe it was, we announced that we've awarded contracts to go ahead London to operate that. And we're now working with them to uh, get everything in place for that to start. Uh, importantly, in that includes charging facilities. So these can be zero emission buses, which we're really keen on. Um, that's the opening proposal. So that's our proposal for 
uh, sometime in 2025 when the tunnel opens, what will run. But we are absolutely aware that there's big development happening in the area, changes, and that we need to see how people respond to what's a really big transformation to the network. Um, so like we do with lots of the, the rest of the bus network, but again, like we've talked about in the traffic space, we'll be really focused on how those new routes are performing. Absolutely discussing that with the council uh, and, and, and hopefully considering adding to that um, because there's big demand for cross river travel and new people living and working and traveling in the area. Um, so that's, that's our plan on the buses. Will there be any consideration for getting people to those bus routes? Obviously, if you don't live on one of those bus routes, it becomes quite a difficult process. Yeah, obviously the existing bus network um, is, is relatively comprehensive in the area and we've designed those services to tie in uh, to those. So, for example, from areas like Eltham, Lee, or you, you can connect into that express bus service around Lee Green, I believe. There'll be a really big interchange opportunity and that's obviously supported by the hopper fare that we now have, which will apply where you'll be able to transition between two bus routes. Um, but yeah, that's, that's again something we're, we'll need to review and adjust, no doubt, um, once we see how it performs and we're in response to whatever feedback we get from our, our new customers and, and, and you. Councillor Hannan. Thank you. Um, I represent East Greenwich Ward, which is obviously going to be um, in the impact zone for Silvertown Tunnel. So there's been a lot of concerns amongst residents about these plans. Um, you're saying that the Silvertown Tunnel will improve the road network and uh, reduce congestion. Um, are you expecting additional traffic uh, in the area because of the tunnel? Because we certainly are. Uh, the short answer to that is no. And our modelling and assessment work shows that, the, yes, we're building new road capacity and improving the resilience of the network. That's going to make things flow and move better. Um, but we're also managing traffic levels, and that's not going to result, therefore, in, a, in an overall increase in traffic. It's actually going to vastly improve the performance of the network. Um, we're hopefully going to have many more cross-river trips, but the vast majority of them being on the new bus services. So we want to accommodate growth, new trips across the river, but on public transport, manage the existing trips and the, the trips that do need to be made by the road network uh, through the measures I've described. Um, now, I know there are concerns about it, and that's why we're here talking to you today, and that's why we've made all the commitments we've described to you today, um, because we know the fears, the concerns, and we know we do need to, to prove that, essentially, and we're committed to doing that. So if, if we do see adverse impacts, we will pick it up through this process we've described. We will have triggers, as we've described, and we'll be responding to that. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's our plan. Have you, are you aware of any new river crossing that's reduced traffic to the area? Um, well, it's, it's quite a, a specific circumstance we're, we're, we're addressing. I mean, there hasn't necessarily been a new river crossing to directly compare this to. So it's very hard to sort of point at a very specific scheme that is trying to do exactly what we do. And, uh, and then we can say, look, here's, here's one that's been done earlier, and this is exactly how it's going to work. Um, so, so it's hard to draw a comparator. Um, but I'd just refer back to the, the comprehensive nature of our work, the experts we've got modelling, assessing this. We've got really world-leading modelling and assessment work. We've got a huge amount of monitoring data out on the network. Um, and we're thinking really carefully about how it's going to work. And we're really confident that it isn't going to result in that induced demand effect that people are concerned with. And that was very explicitly recognised and referenced by us through all the public examinations that that was a concern and that's something we need to manage and we're confident that our overarching plans would do that. And that was recognised by the planning inspectors in the Secretary of State's decision that we had a, a powerful means of managing that. And what we're presenting to you today is the commitment to, to follow through with that, keep it under review and, and prove that to you. Yeah. I mean, and you, sorry. I was just going to add to that. Um, in relation to numbers and the modelling, because that's what we're using. We're using forecasts that are coming out of a traffic model. Um, the adoption of the user charge within the modelling um, is something that has been taken from, uh, learned from other modelling, the way you've got other major road schemes that have had a toll, like the M6 toll, and you've got the, the, the tunnel up near, uh, over the River Mersey. Um, 
and so that that's why we're confident that we're using the most sort of up-to-date figures based on um, uh, reflecting a sort of user charge and that sort of value of time that's placed on that through the modeling and that we're getting we can be quite confident in in the numbers that are coming out of the modeling we've also got independent assurance of the models that we're using and the model that we're using as well councillor hannan just ryan wants to add a point there just to add in that as well as obviously tfl being committed and doing a lot of the work and the thinking and us scrutinizing it it is a requirement of the dco and the monitoring and mitigation strategy which is sort of an integral part of that that it doesn't have that impact so they are you know they're required to deliver that and i suppose as a council it's our job to scrutinize that and make sure we think they are doing it um so it's it may feel like kind of a lot of promises but it is legally backed up and grounded um, and you know the requirement is that if it does have an impact they mitigate that either through the user charge or other methods so i suppose that yeah there is that backing there to the measures described can um, i just ask sorry can i just ask a follow-up to the, the the legal point how long are those commitments in place for so i know you said you're going to do the first year you you report quarterly how long are you required to make sure there's no impact and i, I imagine there must be an allowance for some variant exactly yeah so i mean you'll see reference to a, a a defined monitoring period i believe it's called is that right um in the in the development consent order that's three years but it's also quite explicitly clear and i'm happy to acknowledge and commit right here that if we are seeing impacts at the end of that three years that we still need to consider and deal with we will be extending that and I refer back to some of the stuff we referred to where TfL just does this day to day. This is what TfL does. We're not just promoting the Silvertown Tunnel and then going to run away. Um, we're responsible for the performance of the road network and we're going to keep that under review. So three years is, is the sort of direct answer to your question, but commitment to keep that under review if it needs to be longer. So. Thank you. Did you have a further question? Um, so I, I hear what you're saying and um, all of these obligations and, and that you're monitoring this, but precisely for the reasons that you've said earlier, Andrew, that this area and access to East London is quite key for some of these vehicles, particularly for HGVs that are travelling, and this is why we are concerned that even with a charge in place that that will still happen because they don't want to go to Dartford Tunnel and with petrol prices the way they are, it probably it may be worthwhile going through the tunnel and paying that charge but of course you know you can monitor that and raise charges accordingly if you need to so so that's great but i do want to understand other mitigation measures that you have in place that will be triggered if you're seeing that these thresholds are being reached and you know i'd like to understand a bit better what those thresholds are are we looking at vehicle numbers we're looking at pollution emission levels um what those thresholds are and what the mitigation measures will be i mean the, the very short answer to that is that it's it's not yet defined and agreed and as we referred to earlier that's something we we, we still need to absolutely nail before scheme opening and, and possibly need to adjust but chris might come in with some detail of the thinking and where we are at the moment um but it, it will depend on the specific local scenario yeah, um, yeah. Uh, well it, it it's uh, uh, as Andrew said, it hasn't been defined and agreed yet. However, we've already started our pre-opening monitoring. We've got two years of baseline air quality data. We've got, we're already collecting traffic monitoring data. And we've got bespoke sensors on, on, the, uh, on the roadside, which were um, uh, the locations for which were identified through the, the DCO. Um, and this sort of refresh assessment will, will add to those locations if, if we need to. Um, so we're already collecting the data. We're already starting to understand what the baseline position is, so that when we, the tunnel opens, we can see what what the difference, what's happening. Uh, you know, are there any changes in traffic and air quality, and do we need to do anything, or is it as a result of the tunnel? Is it as a result of something else? You know, we've, we're, we're collecting a lot of data in the background that's going to support the monitoring program that we're doing. So, you, so and I, I would add, will we'll probably have a combination of sort of hard and soft measures and triggers as we've referred to. Like, yeah, it might be uh, as blunt as number of vehicles going through a particular road or, or junction. Um, but I think Chris mentioned before, we have kind of softer measures where our bus drivers are actually intelligence out on the road saying, we're seeing congestion on this bus route every day. That's something we need to, uh, to look at, respond to. 
Um, so it'll be a combination of different things. And, and again, we'll be talking to your officers and, and no doubt happy to come back and, and share more on that uh, in the 18 months ahead. Okay, that's great. I think it would be great for us to, to review the thresholds with you uh, before the opening, so we're all on the same page with what, what is acceptable. Um, you've, I just want to shout, so in terms of mitigation, if you could just explain a bit more what the mitigation measures you're willing to take. I mean, you've, you've talked about charging, and I accept that that's a good one, but are there other things? Are you willing to put in things to improve air quality, for example, or? Yeah, it, again, it will depend on the specific scenario of what's happening, but we might look at gating strategies on particular roads, changes to traffic signals to try and amend the traffic flow, to slow traffic flow on particular sections of the road, to encourage vehicles to take different routes. Obviously, we need to be aware of other measures the council are taking around their control of the local roads, um, where vehicles are, are being banned through, the, through certain uh, uh, routes, through the low traffic neighbourhood approaches, um, through the change of developments that are happening that will come and, and will generate more traffic in particular areas. And we need to sort of carefully understand and articulate if that's the tunnel causing this or is this something else that's happening in the local area. Um, we might make physical changes to the highway network to um, redefine junctions, smooth traffic flow. Um, but it will also be about looking at that broader strategy of transport and why are people making these journeys could they be made if we offered better, more frequent, different bus routes on this route? Uh, could we, should we improve cycling facilities along this route? The announcement about Cycleway 4 recently is going to massively change that corridor between Charlton and Woolwich, and that's, that's something we need to look at and see. That's going to take capacity out. That's, that's going to already create a disincentive for driving along that corridor. So, sorry, I'm not giving you sort of really detailed, tangible sort of examples, it's because it will depend. Um, but what, what, what we've explained today is that we'll have all the data and all the information, and we're committed to talking with you to make sure we do respond to whatever happens. Obviously, we, we have a commitment um, to become carbon neutral within our, our borough like others do. And there's, there's a concern, obviously, here that if emission levels do go up, and that is linked to the Silvertown Tunnel, what, what those measures will be. For example, you know, would you, be, would you consider um, carbon trading and offsetting uh, if that was the case? So just, well, you don't have to kind of answer that now, but that's, you know, what we would want to see if there is a clear link to emission rises because of the Silvertown Tunnel, that we'd want quite strong measures in place to ensure that we still meet our carbon neutral targets. No, and we support that. I mean, just, just shortly, we... TFL, the mayor, are obviously more broadly committed to, to very similar objectives. And so it will be in our interest as much as yours to be understanding those things and responding to them and, and making sure that doesn't happen. And I want to be crystal clear again, we do not expect uh, that increase in traffic, increase in emissions. We, we expect this scheme to actually really improve travel and provide a sustainable footing for creating public transport uh, and better performance of travel in, in Greenwich, New York and beyond. Just on um, on the buses that uh, we were asking about earlier, um, I understand that there's a plan to have buses that take cycles through the tunnel. Is there just the one route or is there more? Uh, so at the moment, we closed a consultation about three weeks ago on a proposal for uh, what we described as a cycle shuttle bus service. So that would be a bus focused on transporting cyclists across the river as opposed to having that conflict of bicycles on our regular uh, bus services. That's not something we commonly do across London for, for good reason. Actually, we want to focus the service on cyclists. We want to test the demand for cycling across the river. Um, whether that's one route, multiple routes, where that stops, how frequent it is, we need to consider the feedback we've just had from this consultation. Um, we'll be publishing a response to the issues raised in I expect before Christmas, uh, and no doubt we'll, we'll share that with the council. And after that, we'll have more details to share. And, and, and again, happy to come back. We'll certainly be sharing with your officers the details when we, we have them. And we're committed to having that service in place for, for the opening. Great. Um, yeah, sure, go ahead, Ryan. Just really quickly, that obviously we've engaged with TfL as officers as they've been developing those bus proposals, and the council responded to that consultation as well. 
setting out various issues we thought needed to be addressed and we'll keep picking those up as we work and see also see other people's responses see cyclist groups responses and make sure they're make, meeting those needs thanks ryan um i think that's all the questions we have for you thank you so much for your time and coming here tonight really appreciate it thank you thanks ryan Our next item is the Woolwich Regeneration Update. Um, and I believe we're joined by Emma and Jeremy. Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy and Aidan. Um, I realized I probably should have declared an interest on this item as a member of the Board of Directors of Woolwich Works. Noted, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, Aidan, are you going to introduce the item? Uh, yeah. So thank you, uh, Councillor Dingsdale. Um, so I'm going to assume you've all read the report on uh, Woolwich regeneration in Woolwich. So as you know, uh, Woolwich Town Centre is a very important area for development in the borough. And it's a very attractive area. It's um, an opportunity area for the Mayor of London to increase um, homes and jobs. And as I've told you at previous meetings, there's an awful lot going on in Woolwich uh, regarding regeneration. So we've got the Future High Street Fund, which is nearly £20 million and has obviously started now. You've probably seen Beresford Square has started to be hoarded off and that's due to finish um, in 2025 that project we've got the um, heritage action zone which again was uh, over 1.75 million and that was for restoring uh, shop fronts and some heritage buildings and putting in the the Woolwich front room and holding events events there um, in terms of Development schemes, we've got the Leisure Centre, which is already in build, which you've seen before. Um, and we've got tram shed, lots of residential developments, including uh, the Woolwich Exchange, Project to Come, Royal Arsenal Riverside, Tesco Development, Woolwich Works, um, Plumpson Road Campus, other schemes that may be coming forward. We've got the Woolwich Island site, which is just, just down here. It's not, not in the report, um, but there's, there's lots of other schemes coming forward. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, if, if you're happy to. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, attend the panel, and I apologise I couldn't attend the site visit. Um, but I think, as uh, Councillor Smith said, you know, we recognise the objective for Woolwich is it's a major um, centre of the borough, the town centre of the borough. I know there's Eltham and, and Greenwich and Plumstead and Thamesmead as well, but it's the biggest town centre and the local plan uh, reflects that and states an ambition to be a metropolitan town centre. So that's really set the agenda in terms of the strategy for the focus on, on Woolwich. With the objectives, of course, of trying to improve the economy of the town centre, but also think about how we can preserve and protect the best of the heritage and the character of the place, but also the people, because the demographics have changed quite considerably over quite a short period of time, and, and improve the built environment. So our strategy has been based on a combination of public and private investment, which you'll see in in the examples given in, in the paper, and delivering a mixture of uses, so housing, but a mixture of types and tenures, um, but also additional retail and commercial development, restaurants, food and beverage, but also leisure, so the leisure centre, but the cinema offering that will be part of the Woolwich Exchange development, and the cultural offer, Woolwich Works, but also the cinema and uh, some of the other cultural activities like in the tram shed and then investment in the public realm. And, and that is about us tactically using the council's assets and 
uh, wherewithal to act as leverage to secure private investment to go alongside the public investment. So we've pursued sort of partnerships, so partnership with Barclay Homes, as uh, Councillor Smith said, on the Royal Arsenal, um, but also with SSQ over Woolwich Exchange and Hill over the residential element of the Leisure Centre. And we've been using the council's regulatory powers, the planning powers through the local plan, but also very specific supplementary planning documents that our planning policy colleagues developed, um, and also um, development management decisions by the local planning board, local planning authority. And in the case of um, Woolwich Exchange, your compulsory purchase powers as a council. Um, and that sort of combination of the council's covenant and land and developing a track record of delivery enabled us to bid confidently for things like Future High Street Fund and Heritage Action Zone. Um, so I think the things I would say that we are aware of and we have been talking to Councillor Smith about are our narrative about Woolwich needs to be stronger to explain to a wider audience why we're prioritising and what we're doing. Um, and we need to look very hard in future about the partnership structure and structures in terms of enabling um, future regeneration. And given the level of investment in Woolwich, the need to think across the council about the stewardship of the spaces and the, uh, you know, how the spaces are used and managed. Um, and with Vicky and Michael, who I know are on next, looking at the planning policy going forward to make sure it strengthens uh, the council's ambitions going forward. And, and on that point, my final point is, is that I'm working with Councillor Smith to um, develop a paper for the regeneration vision beyond 2024, so for the next 10 years, across the borough, which of course Woolwich will be part of. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Um, firstly, can I thank you for, I know you weren't able to attend the site visit, but thank you for putting on the site visit. I found it really, really useful to see this report brought to life. Um, so thank you for the site visit. Um, I'm going to take this report in stages. I think that's probably the most sensible thing to do, if that's all right with everybody else. So I'm going to start with the Future High Street Fund, then the Heritage Action Zone, and then the, the rest of the report and any additional questions. Before I forget those, you've just mentioned the regeneration vision, I think is what you called it. When are you planning to, to do that? Um, I mean, yeah, by the end of the calendar year, but obviously we want to have conversations first before we, we produce it to get, everyone's, um, get everyone to feed in and, and let us know their ambitions and and see what we think, but we're, we are aiming for the end of the year. That sounds great. Um, just, um, I said I'd take Future High Street Fund first, but it's, it's a, a thread that runs through the report and something that um, it was triggered to me, um, Jeremy, when you were speaking about the sort of focus on Woolwich as at the town centre of the borough. Um, I think that's all very well. My my big issue, as someone who lives south of the borough, is actually transport to Woolwich. So it's mentioned a few times in the report, improved, link, um, improved links and enhanced con connectivity around the borough. And I was just wondering, and good public transport infrastructure mentioned as part of Woolwich. We struggle to get to Woolwich from Eltham. Um, we can't use the Elizabeth line. There's no direct link for us. So I wondered what... Um, what conversations you're having with your transport colleagues and how closely you're linked with that because I think that there's a great deal of promise in Woolwich being the town centre of our borough if we can all get to it and use it and benefit from it. So I mean the I suppose the main conversation comes through planning so the next paper transport features a big part of it but obviously the people who have just left uh, TFL are another another partner so it's really about constantly banging the drum for those north-south links, which which I try to try to do. Um, another thing that I did, I was at an event yesterday, and um, they were talking about the Bakerloo extension to Lewisham, and you know I, I asked, could it could the Bakerloo line extend into Eltham and that area? It wouldn't get you to Woolwich, but it would get you to, <laughs> to Lewisham. Um, you know, so so I think we are. 
always looking for what part regeneration can play in increasing links and encouraging TfL to to support those those links and in, in improving the the north south links because we are aware that they're not not as good as they could be. Yeah, and I think it, it's it's about more than just banging the drum though. I think it's it's one of the problems I think we face consistently across the council is taking a holistic look at what we're doing. So, for example, when you look at things like Woolwich Works, when you look at footfall in town centres, a lot of that could be improved if we not just banged the drum but made a more holistic case for for that demand um and i think it is definitely something i mean I, I mention it in transport when we focus on transport and scrutiny as well but i do think it's something that we need to look at more holistically because it could benefit better transport links would benefit every area um not just geographically but every area of the count the council and what we're trying to achieve and um, particularly even with like net zero ambitions for example i would love to get the bus here on, on a night to these meetings, but I can't. Um, so I think it's just something to really be aware of that I appreciate you you mentioning it at events you're going to, but it would be good it would be good to see how regeneration and planning could really partner with transport to make a more holistic case. So so I'd say strategically it is included in in our Greenwich, so in the the borough strategy, and we obviously adopted the transport strategy where it's adopted there. And as I said, it will form quite a big part of the, the uh, local plan when we review that. So I think, I think through those, those strategies, we can create a coherent case. And whenever there is, there is regeneration, obviously we need to make sure transport plays a big part of that because it's also about, about active travel as well. It's not just buses, you know, it's, it's cycle lanes. There aren't cycle lanes north to south. Um, so it's all about all those different modes of transport and how we can improve on them. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions on the Future High Street Fund? No, okay, well, I have a few questions on the Future High Street Fund. Um, it was mentioned in 4.23 that two projects weren't able to be implemented. Um, what were those two projects? Um, there was one um, small one, which was about signage and gateways. So there were a couple of places at the bottom of Hare Street um, where there was some town centre signage. Um, and the, uh, the gatehouse um, is being in part delivered by, but not in its totality, because um, the operator of the gatehouse is going to do that or is likely to do that themselves. It'd be for them to say it, but we um, originally, we were gonna do the gatehouse renovation um, as part of Future High Street Fund, and we scaled that back due to a number of reasons, and they weren't necessarily keen to go with it. The operator is Greenwich Enterprise Board. Subsequently, they've come on, on board and are keen to do it, so it's likely that we'll get it, um, but we won't pay for it all. Thank you. Um, any questions on the Heritage Action Zone? Councillor Williams. 4.3.1, the last sentence, an additional 10,000 was awarded by Historic England to facilitate a cultural pilot project in Woolwich due to the pandemic in 2021. So what I don't understand is what was due to the pandemic. The awards, it, the two things don't seem to marry. Apologies, that's terrible drafting on our part. Um, to try and attract people back to town centres after the pandemic. Historic England had some pots of money which we bid for, um, and, they, um, and we were successful in securing 10,000 pounds, which our colleagues in culture delivered with a, a sort of cultural programme. So apologies for the wording. I think it included uh, tours from local people. I think there was a poetry project. There was the, the High Street Fest, which was last weekend, yeah. Any other questions on the Heritage Action Zone? Any other questions on the rest of the report? Councillor Selden. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Aidan, for the report. Um, I suppose I'm gonna get on with my usual thing of asking uh, 
in terms of the report and the program that we've outlined within it, are there any threats of the delivery under any of the projects that you've got, either in terms of cost or their schedule, or requirement for additional council resources that may be required at any time? I mean, it's all at risk, yeah. And, and you know, in terms of things like the, the leisure centre, obviously a lot of that risk my understanding from working with officers, not, not my own experience, is that a lot of the risk is in the ground. So when you do, uh, when you're building a big building, a lot of, you can uncover a lot of things in the ground, but that's, that was uh, okay. So that didn't, that hasn't done that, but obviously there's always risks of overruns, supply issues. Um, yeah, they, they can be. So, if I may, I was actually after something a little bit more specific, uh, more along the lines of what's keeping you up at night, Aidan, uh, looking at this, and likewise for your children. I mean, feel free to take them in turn. I should think the amount of things that we give uh, Councillor Smith to read and think about keeps him awake all the time. Um, it, it, in, in respect of uh, the schemes, I think there's several things. There's a number of things that are outside the Council's control, and that's the first thing where, they're, where the risk creeps in. So the really big thing that's out of our control is the uncertainty over the building regulations created by um, the Secretary of State um, when he announced that it would be a requirement for buildings over 30 metres to have two stair cores, and then there's been a discussion about buildings over 18 metres having two stair cores and the confusion over the transitional arrangements. So any residential development is at risk. Um, serious viability risk because of the uncertainty but added to that of course we've experienced a period of quite accelerated build cost inflation and as a council you made a decision to increase the amount of funding uh, to go towards the leisure centre. I will say we're um, at the moment slightly ahead of time and on budget on the leisure centre um, the, the, there are so outside our control and also interest rates and the vi and and therefore the interest rate environment and the viability of new housing development so housing is really at risk and there are some schemes like the leisure center that are partly co-funded from the housing so although the council's committed the funding um, it is on the basis that there will be some uh, receipt at some point so those are the kind of things that that we're aware of and we seek to mitigate and manage all the time. The, the other big ones relate to um, land assembly, particularly on the Woolwich Exchange Scheme. And on the Woolwich Exchange Scheme, we use compulsory purchase. And uh, I'm pleased to say that we had the council's decision to make the compulsory purchase order confirmed by the inspector following the public inquiry and we are in the middle of the challenge period, the judicial review challenge period, which expires, I think, on the 3rd of October. So that risk then diminishes. Um, but then we're expecting the developer to start the acquisition process. And of course, that's all at a time of some degree of economic uncertainty. So um, future high street fund risks, as Councillor Smith has said, Again, we're in a contract with a contractor. We've sought to minimize the risk in that contract by getting fixed price contracts. Uh, so some of the risk is defrayed to them um, and, and so on. So um, I think that's probably fair to say are the ones that keep you most awake at night, but we, we do seek to, to sort of mitigate those risks. Right, so I got future high streets and uh was it the uh, leisure centre development are the big things for us to keep an eye out on in future? Is that correct? I, I mean, residential delivery is the, the thing that is really, really quite difficult. And, it, you know, because you've got things like the mini budget where mortgages are much more expensive. So it's ruling out a lot of first time buyers. Um, I think someone said yesterday that the average deposit needed in London something like 125,000 for a first time buyer. Um, so you know you've got you've got uh, issues if you speak to developers they're extremely worried about about all the fire safety uncertainty and that that could if it doesn't stop developments it, it might slow them down because people are waiting for for that certainty for the rules to be just actually be told what they need to do. Um, 
so yeah, so the, the housing market's difficult. It's difficult for developers, it's difficult for buyers, it's difficult for everyone. Councillor Dowse. Thanks. Um, I think there continues to be a bit of an issue around, I'm not sure what the word is, advertising, selling some of the things that Woolwich has to offer outside of Woolwich. Um, you know, speaking to friends of mine, they've never heard of Woolwich Works. I pointed them in the direction. I just wondered how you're going to try to get over that and get it more widely known. So, as you probably know, we had a peer review, uh, an LGA peer review, and um, one of the things they talked about was we need need to have a stronger narrative around around place. So, part of that will be. Through, obviously, through developments, we have an opportunity. You know, when you open a leisure centre, we, we publicise it and, and we publicise events. Um, but as, as Jeremy said in his presentation, we need a stronger narrative around, around Woolwich and promoting what's happening here and, and getting, getting people to come. So thing, um, another thing, it's not, not actually in my portfolio, it's in, in Councillor Lolivar's, but the, the nighttime, um, we're a nighttime opportune enterprise zone, <laughs> yeah. um, which is about, about bringing nightlife to the borough. So a lot of these development things, um, like, like the Future High Street funds and the cinema and the, the leisure centre are also to generate a nightlife as well. So, so all these things will hopefully attract private businesses, which will also advertise themselves, and then Woolwich becomes more of a destination. So it's a combination of the council getting a stronger narrative and working on how, how we communicate and promote ourselves, but also attracting other organisations that will help us do that. Councillor Hannan. Um, can I ask um, about the old leisure centre, or the current leisure centre, and what the plans are for that? If, sorry if I've missed it in a previous meeting. Um, so the, part of the leisure centre, when the decision was taken years ago to build the new one, was that we wouldn't close the leisure centre and then spend three years building one. Um, so the plan was, has always been to keep it open until the new one opens. But obviously when that closes, we'll, um, we, we will look at what we're, we're going to do with that and the opportunities that will be available. I think, j just to add to that, I think that there might even have been a formal decision to dispose of it uh, some years ago. I'm not sure whether that's... <laughs> I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think, you know, talking about future regeneration strategy, um, you know, the access to the river, particularly down Hare Street, um, and the, where the ferry and the ferry roundabout, that, that's, you know, quite an obvious part of future regeneration potential for Woolwich and how it strengthens it. So we haven't made any decisions about the, leisure, the existing leisure centre other than we invested a bit more money to keep it going. Um, until the new one opens, but that's very much part of what we need to do looking forward. And do you know when you're going to be developing those plans so that we can, and I'm assuming that you'll be presenting them to us? Uh, so it will probably form part of the, the regeneration paper we, we hope to bring, but it's also likely to appear in the, the local plan, because part of the local plan is you have uh, a process called a call for sites, which is where you identify potential development sites. And just wanted to ask as well about, so there is, there's, a, there's affordable housing in the developments that you're putting together for Royal Arsenal Riverside as well as for the, the leisure centre area. Was there consideration of having council homes in part, as part of this development as well? Uh, I think there, uh, there was, yeah, but the the housing for the leisure centre, part of that going for a deal with, with Hill means that they're funding part of the leisure centre. Yeah, um, 
Yes, uh, there has been consideration, and actually, the so uh, specifically on the leisure centre scheme, so the Hill scheme that you're referring to, the um, social rented homes, the affordable homes as part of that, we are going to buy, the council are going to buy, and that's part of the development agreement that we have with Hill. Um, and is a bit of a complicated reason why, because I, I think Councillor Asgar has asked this question at panel previously, um, was obviously we have effectively sold the land to the rear of the new leisure centre to a developer for housing, and that generates a capital receipt, which will help fund the new leisure centre and the, the tram shed renovation. Um, but the council was keen to look at buying back the social rented for council stock. And obviously that gets purchased from the housing revenue account, which is a different council account, as you know. And we can use some right to buy receipts that are ring fenced to aid that purchase. So yes, we're, I'm always on the lookout, because part of my brief is new housing and new council homes. I'm always on the lookout for new council homes. And that is one scheme that we're do, we, you know, we are looking to do that on. And, and on the, um, do you remember the, we bought some homes from Lovell uh, on the, the Woolwich Estates regeneration. And so when, when there are new schemes, you know, we would consider buying some of those for council housing. Thanks. Um, one final question from me. In 9.3, you mentioned the regeneration strategy paper. Is that the regeneration vision that you've also mentioned tonight, or are they separate things? Yeah, it is. I think what, we, what we're aiming to do is set out a, what we think should be the areas and neighbourhoods of focus for the next sort of 10 years and what that might mean and might look like. And then um, when, you know, obviously members have helped shape that and then there is a formal decision that allows us then to go and start working on the frameworks and the detail of what that would mean. So, yes, it's, that's the same thing. Great. Look forward to seeing that. Um, if there are no further questions, thank you very much for your time, Jeremy. Aidan, I'm sure you're sticking around for the next item. <laughs> thank you all. So the next item is an update on the local plan, and um, we have uh, Vicky and Michael joining us. Aidan, are you presenting the report? Sorry, Councillor Smith, are you presenting the yeah, report? Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this paper is on an update on the local plan. As you know, we've had the Regulation 18 uh, consultation, which was the our big themes consultation, and that that's now closed. That closed at the start of September, so we're busy uh, reviewing the responses to that. And then the next process will be gathering lots of evidence um, and then looking to draft, draft the local plan and then we'll need to go out to consultation again. Uh, so the draft will take about a year, then we'll do consultation again and the consultation on the draft will be more intensive than it was on the, the big schemes. Uh, big theme, sorry. And, uh, and then after that, we submit it to the planning inspectorate. Um, thank you. In 4.5 and 4.6, you know, there's 271 responses to the consultation. That doesn't seem like a huge number to me. I wondered how that compares to other consultations you run. And you've noted the exception between 18 to 29. So have you given any thought to how you will engage that age group in the next round? So not any detailed thought, but in terms of the next round, in terms of consultation, I think we've done a comms plan, um, which is looking at what our aims are. And, and the, the sort of three main aims are to involve a wide range of stakeholders and actually the RAG 18 consultation, which is revealed now that 18 to 29 year olds don't tend to get involved in local plan. That's no surprise because that's usually a trend that does come through. And it's how we can make a local plan more exciting to uh, younger people. Um, and that is one of our challenges. So obviously the other, the other two aims in terms of what we're trying to do in cons is to encourage feedback from people who don't usually get involved or share their views. And that, that reveals that to us as well. 
and then opportunities to engage people in person and on, and on, as well as online. So the, the Reg 8 team was done all online. We had a booklet, we had hard copies in the library, but it wasn't online. And then media pushed it out into the, the social media networks as well. So, so part of the comms plan is looking at how we can expand on that. And it's not set in stone yet because we have to still give it a bit more thought in terms of how we're going to do it. But it, the basics in the comms plan are looking at an interactive website, exhibitions and consultation materials, not only in libraries but around the borough, and then bespoke consultation events, and then a series of meetings with stakeholders, such as young people, and looking at the young council that we have and how we can get them involved, and how we can make it um, more exciting as a document, and, and the issues are more exciting that they want to get involved in, because actually as a cohort, they will benefit greatly from you know, increased housing, increased affordable housing, increased social and economic facilities around the borough, et cetera. So it is a challenge, but it's also a challenge to get not just the young people, but those <coughs> more silent groups that tend not to get involved, either because they don't trust the council or they don't think that we take their views into account when they provide them. So we are doing a lot more thinking about how we can do that more effectively. Um, a couple of suggestions from me that yeah. just, just spring to mind. Um, I wonder, we've obviously got a couple of universities in the borough. I wonder if actually going into them and engaging people there would be helpful. And similarly, if we maybe use paid social media campaigns that are targeted at those age groups rather than just the sort of generic um, things pushed out through Royal Borough of Greenwich, that might also be quite helpful. I saw a survey recently from some sort of London group looking at young people under 40, which I was quite pleased to actually take part in, on housing. But it, it was targeted, I think, at my age range on social media in a way that was accessible. So that might be something to look into. Um, sorry, you didn't answer the first part of my question, which was two, 271. How does that compare to other consultations? Um, I've actually met the people from Commonplace today um, and spoke to them a little bit about this. And actually, 271 is, is fairly good for a local plan consultation, especially at this early stage where we're not really making proposals at this point. There is no draft plan to review. So obviously that generates more limited interest, I think, um, when we go out at the next stage. And if we obviously use all these different techniques, I'm hoping for, for more responses. But they did say to me that um, kind of in terms of like the conversion rate of people actually making a response once they've visited the website, that was also a good um, comparator to other local plan consultations that they've hosted. So although it seems very low, um, you know, in compared to other other authorities and other people running these sorts of things, I think we've done we've done okay. And um, I mean there's a limit to how how far you can engage people on some of this stuff when it's very, very high level and no specifics are being proposed, I think. And then given there's um, only been sort of 271. I know you haven't done the in-depth analysis yet, but I'm assuming you had a bit of a flick through. Has anything sort of stood out to you? Anything surprising or particularly telling? Um, we have to confess that we haven't had it um, packaged up yet from Commonplace. Because there's a series of, um, you know, yes, no questions or list the three top ones. And then there was a whole host of free text questions which are much, which take much longer to go through. So I think that's one thing we can come back in the future and feed back to you what people have said to us and how, and we can think about how we can display that in, a, in an easy way to digest going forward. Thank you. Um, Councillor Salden. Yeah, thank you. I was at a very interesting presentation this morning uh, and I would listen to a presentation by a professor of planning from Westminster University. And one of the things that was kind of discussed there uh, amongst him and other colleagues was uh, the systems approach to how we develop our local plans. And one of the things that came up in that was that uh, we're estimated within the next 15 years that we'll have approximately 20 million electric cars on our roads. And what they were pointing out there was that if you just took 5% of the capacity of an electric car's battery, you would end up with 100 gigawatt hours worth of storage capacity, which is essentially pretty much all we think we need. So if you kind of take a look at a, any house or any flat, it's typically a sort of five, kilo, uh, five kilowatt hour battery, something like that. Um, I notice you've got a section on climate change. 
Uh, do we have a view, are we looking to develop things like system integration between electric vehicles and households and how we might be able to do that? So, you know, if one were to be able to run a cable across one's pavement or under one's pavement, I know there are similar things like that in, I believe Oxford has one, uh, that might help us unlock something within our borough in terms of energy storage and would it be possible to integrate that within our considerations? Yeah, I mean, as you, as you know, the current plan is virtually silent on the issue of climate change, but what we'll, we will work with our, with our transport colleagues in terms of how we can think about that sort of issue in the plan and how we can reflect that in terms of um, policies. So not only, so the local plan will look at strategic policies and then it will look at what they mean spatially around the borough. And then there will be a whole series of what I would call technical type of development management policies. And that's something that we would seek to encourage. So we would seek to encourage a more sustainable approach to development across the borough, net zero. And that will include such things as, you know, the use, well, minimum use of cars, because actually we want to promote active travel in terms of cycling and walking. But where, you know, cars are here to stay, whether we like it or not. But it's encouraging that electric vehicle and then part of that will be electric charging vehicle points around the borough and how they can int integrate into and work with um, sustainable electricity in homes so it's something we can we will we will look into but it's how how detailed we would think about going in the local plan on a policy like that but it's something that we can consider you know all options are on the table at the moment we haven't ruled anything out yeah, I think for me, the key thing in that was that, you know, for the sake of a £30 cable, it's possible to essentially unlock 50 to 60 kilowatt hours worth of electric battery capacity. Um, uh, so if that's just one thing that, you know, I can pick up from a meeting in the morning um, and with the consultation responses, are there any plans to go out to look for effectively the low hanging fruit, the future directions? Because this is a, a planning framework which has got to last, you know, a decade at least. So it's, we don't really want to be designing it for 2023 when it's got to be good for 2033. And how are we planning to approach that? Yeah, I mean, the local plan, you know, has, it has a lifespan of five years and then it should be reviewed and updated. But it's looking at a 10 to 15 year period, a much longer period. So I think, you know, sustainability and climate change is, is changing, you know, regularly in terms of new technology and then how that how that can be embraced in new development so we will look at all those options and and how we can factor those into development going forward i think one thing you've got to remember about the local plan is it's it's about how it deals with land use and development going forward so it has to be linked to development so that's that's where we can up the sustainability credentials of the borough through, through some policies. And at the moment, it would be wrong of me to say what those policies will be, because we haven't done all the evidence gathering and all on all the work related around that. Councillor Hannan. Okay. Um, I, yeah, thank you. Thank you for explaining um, your position around climate change um, on the local plan. and it, um, you know, it's really great to see that, that there's a focus on this. And particularly in 4.15, we talk about identifying areas for biodiversity and ecological enhancement. I think this is really important because we've got developments happening in our ward in East Greenwich, Silvertown, Tunnel and others where they're asking us um, what kind of, where there's, where there's already a requirement for them to improve biodiversity in the area because they know there's going to be a negative impact from the construction of the tunnel. And we've been finding it difficult to identify appropriate sites for them to invest in. So if your plan can, and I'm sure as, as we have all of this other development happening across the borough, there'll be similar issues. Um, so it'd be great if the plan could specifically outline potential areas for biodiversity gain that we could invest in going forward um, to uh, offset some of the impact from developments. I believe the Prime Minister has scrapped the rules on biodiversity in this game, or, or delayed, delayed. Um, <laughs> but of course that is something that we could incorporate in our local plan 
um, it, you know, the, the the rules that they've delayed, we could we could include those in that because obviously it is really important to to have a biodiversity net gain. Um, and in terms of looking at sites for it, uh, I mean. <laughs> Just to, I mean, the, the call for sites exercise that we plan to do, although it's focused on finding development sites to deliver the growth targets we need, it is also um, a vehicle to, to put forward sites such as those for ecological enhancement or protection or open spaces, things the community wants to protect. So that's something we'll be encouraging um, when we do that exercise, that it isn't just about finding sites for new homes and new jobs. It's about kind of protecting those spaces that are, that are vital to to get in that balance between growth and, um, and and protecting what we like in the borough. I think that that's a really important part of what a local development plan should do to provide that overall picture of, of what's happening in the area and how development is being offset by investment in other areas within the community. Councillor Dowse. I think I just wanted to come back to the point that was raised in the last um, item um, about moving around the borough and to see if there is any anything that you're considering because it is quite a big issue, particularly for people in the south of the borough. We, uh, it's much easier for us to get to Bromley than it is for us to get to Woolwich, say. So to move out of borough is easier to move with than to move within the borough. Have you got any thoughts? So I think, you know, in terms of the thrust of the, the next version of the local plan, it will be looking at promoting active travel and public transport. So the plan alone can't do that. So it's about working with key stakeholders, in particular TfL, not only around when we get development and how the impact of that development is going to be on the network, but also just about how the borough works now and how it operates in, in movements around the borough and, and what we can do to enhance it and what bits are missing that we can have, not just planning, but the wider regeneration and transport arm of the council can have more conversations with TfL who are there to provide um, bus routes, et cetera, as to, to what, what can be achieved out, outside of the local plan as well as how we pitch the, the policies in the local plan in terms of active travel, public transport, and the promotion of public transport as opposed to private-based vehicle movements around the borough. And we, we would um, we do things like... Uh, working with the the transport strategy, like policies around streetscape and, and cycle, putting cycle lanes and and things like that, bus priority schemes, uh, could all be incorporated into it. Councillor Salden. Thank you. Um, so looking through one of the areas that, and I'm not sure whether this can, is normally integrated in plans, but around sort of skill de development and use of localisation. So, you know, uh, the ability to use local contractors as a precondition within our local plan. Uh, it, would it be possible to integrate, say, conditions like that within it? Uh, I'm particularly interested in sort of building skills of the future, like, you know, solar panel installation. If we could, as part of our social value requirements, require that they take on a certain number of apprentices, uh, or if maybe we could tie in with uh, our local schools or they sponsor a course somewhere. So, so we do that now in terms of the work that GLAB do, and not only about securing sort of skills and apprenticeships through new development, but also around tapping into the local supply chains and local, local firms. We can't actually obviously list those by name because that would be interfering with the market, but we can, we can insist that developers go out there and tap into local supply chains as well as provide apprenticeships and opportunities um, that come through development, such as for construction workers. So that's something we do now, and I think that's something that's important to bring through into the next version of the local plan as well. So if I could ask, in terms of the way in which you're bringing that through, are you thinking about a minimum local content requirement in terms of local supply chain? So I know when you take a look at sort of master planning in a uh, number of other nations, they will actually say you need to have a certain amount of local content. Uh, we similarly have those in our trade arrangements as well. 
I mean, that's something we can consider. Um, when we um, give planning permission for major developments now, it will have a clause in that talks about local contracts and local supply chains. And we work heavily with our employment and skills and colleagues in regeneration to ensure that's delivered and, and it should be, then be monitored through the Section 106 process. But we can also look at what else is used across uh, London, across the, you know, wider than London, to see if there are any ways we can make that better and work, make that work better and even potentially looking at targets. Are there any further questions from the panel? Great, thank you all so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the next item is on actions monitoring. Is everyone happy to close the actions that we have received? Um, and just to note that we're still waiting um, for updates from the cabinet member for equality, culture and communities. Um, and finally, um, commissioning of future reports. Um, there are three currently listed in the papers. Um, strategic asset review, cultural strategy, and cultural performance monitoring. Um, but culture performance monitoring, I've spoken to the culture team and they won't have the date, meaningful data that they can share with us until the panel after. So I propose to roll that one over and just commission strategic asset review and culture strategy. That's agreeable to the panel. And the meeting is now closed. Thank you all. <laughs>